Welcome to Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle, coming up on the programme this week. The council and I got, she was amazingly, who really, really, really cared. But she was under so much stress herself. Because she was coping with like two and a half pounds of coffee and staff and support staff who were in varying degrees of crisis. If you go into a construction site, you're going to go, here's the boots, here's the high-vis jacket, here's the helmet, here's the foreman's office, here's the first aid kit. You, they never go, as a member of the construction industry, the biggest threat to yourself is actually yourself. People have talked about the scene where Martin screams in the car. Oh my God, I still do that. You know, it's cathartic in some ways, but it's like, it's that scene, I think, is something that a lot of people can relate to. And I'll be reminding you how you can make connections with mental health organisations within your community. It's Mental Health Monday. Hey all, Mick here. Uh, Just a quick word from me ahead of this week's podcast, uh, episode 250 of Mental Health Monday. Thank you to everybody who supported the programme since we started back in 2017. Uh, Former producers, John Fogarty and Lizzie Doyle, of course. Now, this week's programme was recorded at the Liverpool City Region's Mental Health and Work Summit at the Arena and Convention Centre. Thank you to everybody who came down on the day. Thanks to Jake Mills, who was the day's host as well, organised as well by the Metro Mayor of the Liverpool City. City Region, Steve Rotherham. A special thank you to all those delegates, people who came down and were audience members for episode 250 of Mental Health Monday. Now this was recorded in front of a live audience. Uh, You'll notice in some parts the sound isn't quite uh, what we'd normally be doing on Mental Health Monday, but give us a bit of a break because it was recorded through the PA system uh, that was running through the room at the time, which just goes to show if you want the full effect of Mental Health Monday, next time we do a live show, do come down and see us. I've got a great guest for you. Thanks once again. This is episode 250. Okay, we're the home of the UK's conversation about mental health. Welcome to Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle and we are here in Liverpool at the Arena and Convention Centre for a very special day at the Mental Health Summit organised by the Liverpool City Region to talk with a brilliant guest who I'll introduce in just a few moments' time. But we're here also to mark the 250th episode of Mental Health Monday. Thank you to our live audience. Really appreciate you being here today. Hopefully we're going to have a fascinating conversation. You're going to flavor of what the podcast is about. And don't forget all previous episodes of Mental Health Monday are available wherever you get your podcasts and they're free and uh, able to download right now. Uh, our 250th guest is someone I've known for a number of years and he started out as a guy who was a, a cabbie and he used to be a copper and he liked to do a little bit of writing on the side and we get talking about all kinds of various different things on the radio program that I was involved in at the time. And he seemed to have something about him, seemed to have something about him. There was something about this guy that looked like potentially maybe he might be going somewhere. And then maybe two, three years ago, he said, I'm having a conversation with uh, some people who were sort of involved in TV production. And I was like, what, well, actual people? And he said, real people. I, th- I think they were even in a different country or he had to go to London or somewhere fancy like that. Now, we're... Next time he came on the show, you know that, that thing I was talking to you about? It's actually, the BBC are going to do it. And I said, what? On the telly? He said, Martin Freeman is going to be in it. And I said, Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> Next thing you know, The Responder is a huge, huge international hit. The writer and creator is Tony Schumacher and is our special guest on the program today. You talk about uh, Bilbo Baggins. I had a meeting. I, I'd written this thing, and I, I was I wasn't a taxi driver when I did it. Mate. If you recall, I was working at the tip in McGull, the council <laughs> tip, and um, I uh, I got the, they rang me up and said, "Do you want to come for this meeting? Uh, Martin wants to meet you. He's read your script, you know." Oh, yeah, all right, yeah. So I got on the train and I went all the way to London, and I swear to God, from Crew all the way to Houston, I was thinking, "Don't call him Tim from the office." <laughs> Don't call him Tim from the office, right? And I went into the room where he was sitting, and I went, I like Tim. <laughs> <laughs> and we still laugh about it now. Well, I do. Um, one of the things that struck me about the responder was that when I knew you used to be a, a, a copper on the, on the beat in Liverpool, and that was going to be the, 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 the sort of the, the hook for the show, if you like, um, I was unaware of how front and centre you were going to put the lead characters 
mental health, but of course with echoes of your own journey as well. There must have been a point for you where you thought, okay, I'm going to tell this story and I'm not going to hide away from the mental health of my lead character. I'm actually going to put that right at the forefront of what this guy's going through. I wanted to do something. It's funny, really, because I had a breakdown when I was a cop. That's why I left the police. I've been in the police for like 11, 12 years and um, it wore me away. It just like emotionally destroyed me, mentally destroyed me. But I never used to tell people. I was homeless for two months. And um, I'd never tell anyone. That, it was my secret kind of thing of how ill I was. And I wouldn't tell people. It was like I was ashamed. I was like this guy who's always been the one. Like my dad died when I was young and I was like the youngest kid. But I was the one who organised the funeral. I was the one who did the running around for the, for the wake and all this kind of stuff. So I was always the one who organised. And then when I was a copper, I was always the one who'd walk into the room and go, you've you got to find out in the next 55 minutes that I can talk a lot, you know. So I used to, I'd walk into a room and I'd feel like, oh, I'll take control of this. I'll be the one in charge. And it's like, when you're suddenly not capable of being the one in charge, it's embarrassing. And that was me. When, you know, so I couldn't, I was living in my car with my dog and um, it was grim and I wouldn't talk to people about it. Then as time went on, and I started being a writer and I started opening up about this thing. It took me years, it took me about seven years. I started opening up about it. I felt better for talking about it, for getting it out there. And the opportunity to make a television show with Tim from the office, you, you're going to, it was just the perfect opportunity for me to say, let's make it about this. Talk about it, you know, get it out there. And in terms of that, the lead character's story, Tim from the office, um, he, he's in therapy right from the off. So yeah. we're, not, we're, not, we're not going to explore someone's sort of, uh, descent into difficulties. We're, we sort of, we plunged, aren't we, right at the start of, this is a guy who's got issues. We're going to explore what those issues are. And also we're going to follow that journey through the therapy as is laid out through, presumably, his, his police force or his, his union back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, that, that's kind of loosely based on me. There, there was a an amazing lady at uh, Merseyside Police who uh, was our counsellor. They were very careful, or they were then, I don't know if they still are now, but they were very careful to not call the therapy, it was counsellor. And um, I, like, prevaricated for about 18 months about whether or not to ask for help. Because, again, it's this embarrassing, I'm not embarrassed, you know. And, like, in the police at that time, and I can only speak about that time, um, like, having... as you know, as, as we would call it then, cracking up, it was almost seen as a, a ticket out of work in the streets. It was like it was almost seen as like um, uh, a bonus, you know. Oh, you know, he's gone mad, like, it's great. He's got off the streets. And, like, you saw it as the thing. So much so that the, the occupational health units, I don't know if it still is, but it used to be on Mather Avenue in uh, Allerton, just outside the city centre. And we used to call it Mather Avenue. Because it's, it's brilliant, isn't it? I'm going to Madden Avenue, brilliant. You might get a few weeks off work in the streets. And like now I look back at it and go, that's all because we were just scared to talk about it. And none of us to talk about it. So like the, the council and I got, she was amazing, like, who really, really, really cared. But she was under so much stress herself. Because she was coping with like two and a half thousand coffees and staff and support staff who were in varying degrees of crisis. And that must have been impossible on their own. In, in terms of your own sort of story, have you sort of pinpointed that moment where your mental health became like a problem? In the first episode, for instance, of the program, you kind of see the sort of the, the sort of bombarding that the responder has yeah. to deal with, and it's one thing, then it's and it's back to the first thing again, and it's back to the first thing by the end of the night. Was that just compounding what you were already going through, or was that one of the factors? That, that was were one of the that? factors, but it's like, for me in the show, the very, very first opening scene of the show was where Chris, Martin's character, looks at the camera and says, I just want to be normal. And that was how I felt for about the last two and a half, three years of my career. I just want to be normal. And so the, the idea was what we were going to do was. Just show that it's not always him being under acute pressure. Sometimes it's like just the grind, it's like being a you know a pestle and mortar. It's just the grind of appearing normal. It's just the grind of, of going to a boring job and having to appear engaged with it when you're thinking about 
the guy who co- committed suicide an hour ago. It's just that constant grind of it that I wanted to put in. So, like, it's like it, it, it's swaps and peaks for me. That was what we were trying to show with it, you know. You get these moments as well, sort of within the, the production of the show where this sort of like high pitch yeah. tone kicks in. And at the moments where the character is obviously really struggling, this sort of tone becomes almost unbearable. It's, you know, it's awkward for the, the listener as well. Yeah, yeah. I just wondered whether or not you had any influence over that, or if you wanted to, if you felt that was a sort of a good way of representing those moments. I didn't want it to be honest with you. When we first talked about it, I didn't want it because obviously you're part of the team. You know, I do all the writing and all this kind of stuff, but it's like you're part of the team of execs and producers who have ideas and input, you know, and, and make the show better. And initially, I didn't want that sound because I wanted, I knew that Martin was going to be that good that we wouldn't need it. But with hindsight now, I look back at it and I go, it was unsettling for people. I was a bit, there were some people who come on and said, listen, I've got, you know, cynicism like it, it really messed me up. And I, I regret that. But um, we probably should have had a warning or something on it. But I think it unsettled people. And I wanted, there is that thing about when you're in moments of crisis, and we've all been in it. I'm in one now. Do you know what I mean? When you're in that moment of crisis, you have that that thing about when you feel like someone's like driving a pick into your head, and it crowds your thoughts. It's like it pushes out the reason and it pushes out the, the thing, especially when a panic attack. Um, so I wanted to to show that in some way. And, and when they come up with the idea, so I, I think it worked. Did it work? I I, it worked. I'll tell you why I think it worked. It was because I think. You know, we're in a room full of people who, who sort of know about mental health and talk about mental health. But I think there's still a lot of people out in the wider community, you know, millions of people yeah. watching your show, who don't necessarily recognize, maybe didn't think this is a show about mental health. Yeah. But actually, when they saw that moment, I felt maybe they'd have gone, oh, yeah, this is awkward. This is, yeah, this is too much, this. This is getting too much. And I think one of the conversations around mental health, mental health in the workplace, mental health at home, is so much based around language. And actually, we've all grown up in a world where, We've not had those conversations about mental health and what it means. Instead, the conversations we've had are the, the Looney Bin and Madder yeah, Avenue. Yeah, those, yeah. Are the, those are the things that we've all learned growing up. And I think one of the, the great sort of challenges for the generation now, who I believe are massive groundbreakers in terms of the, the mental health conversation, is about resetting the language mm-hmm. and resetting people's abilities to talk about mental health and their sense of well-being and their sense of hope or their mm-hmm. sense of sadness or loss or grief or whatever it is, rather than that thing of, he just can't cope. Yeah. He's struggling him a bit. I think those, those conversations are absolutely crucial. And I think if we presume that everybody's already there and is already having the conversations, we'll leave people behind. I, and, and I think that's, what, that's a real danger. I totally agree with you. I think I said it to you with Jake before, um, there's a thing about, I, I can absolutely guarantee that I've tweeted about this today and somebody will have said, oh, another thing about mental health again. Oh, here we go, mental health. But you wouldn't say that if someone had a broken leg. You wouldn't say it if someone had dislocated the thumb. You, and we need to look at mental health as a, as a, just as a, in the same way as we'd look upon a physical impairment like that. We need to say, you know, it needs to be part of it. Oh, you broke your leg. We need to be able to say, no, you know, you, you, you've had a breakdown. But we need to say, you know, I'm, I'm not, because if people start talking about it, you know, I, I can, all I can say is like 15, 20 years ago, I started admitting I had a big nose, right? And now I'm cool with it. Do you know what I mean? Because I started talking about it. And like, I think we all started talking about it. This is why I'm happy to talk about my mental health, because I, I've got past that, that barrier, you know, Jake's charity. The stigma is, you know what I mean? It's all about that. It's beating that. It's getting past the stigma, moving past it, and talking about it. I think it's so important. And that's why one of the things that we really lean into it in the show, you know, get it out there, get talking about it. People have talked about the scene where Martin screams in the car. Oh my God, I still do that. You know, it's cathartic in some ways, but it's like, it's that scene, I think, is something that a lot of people can relate to. Either wanting to scream in a car or screaming in the car. And that was one of the reasons why we put that in, because we thought it's something that will, will resonate. That's me, that I do that. I think, I think it's a huge point about that wider conversation, and we're here at the Mental Health and Work Summit, so you know, let's have the conversation. You know, if you go into a construction site, you're going to go, here's the boots, here's the high-vis jacket, here's the helmet, here's the foreman's office, here's the first aid kit. You, they never go, 
as a member of the construction industry, the biggest threat to yourself is actually yourself. You're more likely to die by suicide as a member of the construction industry than any other workplace in the country. But you wouldn't be allowed on that work site if you weren't wearing the boots, you didn't have the jacket, Sorry. and someone would shout you out. You can't, you can't come here dressed like that, mate. Yeah. You can't come in. That, that conversation around the mental health, and people think, well, you'll never get it to that point. We need to be at that point where we need to be saying, how are you? How have you been today? What are your marks out of 10? Well, actually, you've, you've scored lower than five for the last you know, three or four weeks now, so we're going to have a conversation around X, Y, or Z. We can put those things in place if we want to. There's a brilliant thing someone said to me a couple of weeks ago, uh, funny enough, a construction thing. We've got some guys who do some work in our house at the moment. Um, and one of them, we were talking about this because he'd seen the show. We were talking about it. And he said, his mate um, always says, I'm not feeling great. He doesn't say, how are you? And he said, what's brilliant about it is, he said, we're sitting in the pub. And Barry, for the sake, I don't know the guy's name, but Barry will say, oh, it's terrible this week. I'm just so fed up. You know, I feel terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, and you'll find that other people start going, do you know what? I've been the same. You know, I haven't seen anyone for four days. I've been sitting in the house all week on my own. You know, whatever, sitting in my bed, sitting all week on my own. And it, it, that's like, it, 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 having these conversations is finding, I think, is finding new ways to address the issue between. So on building sites, it's incredibly hard. I haven't worked on building sites. I've been, I've worked on demolition and roofing. Um, not at the same time. Um, <laughs> well, if you spoke to me, old boss, maybe, possibly, I don't know, but I work on that. And it's like, it's full of uppy suffy fellows who would sooner fall off the roof than say they felt like jumping off the roof. You know, and it, it's like, we need to get to a point where they're cool. With it. That's why it was so refreshing with the um, film, the builder who's working their ass. It was like, yeah, this is my, you know, we all have this conversation about it. We all watch the show. Didn't give me this, but we all watch, you know, and we, we all talk about it afterwards. That's brilliant. Oh, well, I think it's brilliant. And I think that, that idea that the conversation's taking place, some, sometimes there's this phrase, and you guys will have heard this phrase, of difficult to reach parts of the community. Difficult to reach. And I always think difficult to reach or can't be bothered to reach. Because, like, if you want to go and find middle-aged blokes in their 50s to talk about mental health, you can go and find them. And you can do it on building sites. So you can do it down the footy. You can find them down the pub. You can create events and workshops and dad sheds and all of those things to find those people. But sometimes we write people off, don't we, as, well, you won't want to talk. Um, it's too hard to reach those sort of people. So we'll just have to accept the suicide numbers and we'll accept the problems that it brings at, at work because yada, 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 it's too hard to do otherwise. But actually, and the people in the room will testify to this, if you, if you want to find those people, go and get them. If you've got the funding to find those people, you can find those people. If workplaces are empowered to find those people and support those people within the workplace, they will do so because they're a core part of what any business or community looks like. It costs a fortune, people being upset. I mean, that's, that's, that's why we've got health and safety. It costs a fortune for people to be upset. I mean, it's just that simple. When I was a copper, and, you know, I'd go off sick with stress for like three months, which I did. It, how much did that cost them? Why not invest some of that money into keeping dirty Bobby working? And that's what it, it astonishes me. And it's great to see this company. It's great to see some of the brilliant companies with the Dallas Bears here, you know, and doing stuff. It's brilliant to see that. Um, but it's just astonishing me that, that we don't look upon it as something physical. You know, mental, that, maybe that's part of the problem is the name that we give it, mental health. You know, because it is a physical, you know, debilitating situation. Can I ask you about, obviously, the, the, the sort of story that you're telling from Chris's point of view on screen is a representation of your view from a couple of decades ago. Mm -hmm. But it's quite clear, like, they, they put him into counselling, they put him into these therapy sessions, and yet his workload is just as high as it's always been. And I think this is one of those sort of, I call it, I call it well-being washing, that a workplace will go, well, we've got... Oh, you're struggling? Call this hotline number. Are you struggling? Uh, go to this website. You're struggling in your own time. Go and visit the Hub of Hope and find a mental health resource close to you. By the way, I want that report on my desk by Monday morning. I'm going to be emailing you on a Sunday night, and I want those responses left, right, and centre. You've got to have that whole approach. That's got to change. But Chris's situation wasn't supported in that environment at all because it was 
carry on, but maybe this, 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 this therapy thing might do some, some work for you. But none of the underlying issues were being tackled no. at all. And I think that's, that's one of those things as well where some people go, well, we've got all these things in place. We put Tony in for counselling. We took him down Mather Avenue. What more could we have done? And the answer was probably something else. And I'm hoping you can give us a sense maybe of what should have been, what, what could it have been? What would that support have looked like potentially for you? I, I think I think one of the problems with the police at that time, and I can only speak about it at that time, was you were seen as being somebody who was probably malingering. And and what they would do is they would send you to someone who was doing the best that they could do within their qualifications. The best that they, they could do. You know, her name was Lynn in the show, so I'll call her Lynn now. Lynn would I would go to see Lynn and I might have to go when I've just been working nights and go to sleep for two hours and then get up and then go and see Lynn and then go on the side and grab another two hours sleep and go and back to work again that night. But you you would always Lynn was I you know, and I don't mean to be disparaging because she was doing the best with what she had available, but Lynn was like a garage down the corner. You know, it was like you know, one of these guys who's got like an oily pit, you know, and just go in like and can do your oily brakes like or when you go in with something like ah oh, amazing can't fix that. I think Lynn was in that situation that she was unable to, she didn't have the tools to fix sophisticated problems. The first time I've ever described myself as sophisticated. But, and I think that the, the police at that time, what they could have done better was, they could have maybe had a way of passing it up the chain. But obviously, you know, they would say, well, we haven't got the money for that. But again, it goes back to that thing about where What's better, having a copper who's out there functioning and doing his job properly, or having Chris out there who's on a hair trigger, who is breaking down crying, which is where I was, who can't sleep, who sits in his car screaming and driving around all night because he can't face going home. You know, so that, that there's like, for me, it, there should have been someone to pass it up the chain. And also an attitude that was probably more supportive than... Oh, he just wants to end this off, you know. And it, it's difficult as well because I, I feel for, for HR. I, I desperately do. It must be incredibly difficult because there will be malingering. There definitely is not. How you sit through that, I have no idea. I feel, I, I really feel for them. But you've got to, I think you've got to take every case completely seriously and say, oh, what's the best I can do? And not apply formulas to it. You know this thing about, like, oh, you've been off for three months and then, you know, you drop into a different series and you say, can I have your money off you and you're not, you know. So we're not saying to you get well. We're saying, get back here or get skinned. And that's just doomed to me because all you're doing is someone who's struggling with pressure. You're saying, by the way, you're not paying your money. So come back. Oh, all right, yeah, I'll go back and just hit someone over the head and then you kick me out. Because that's, that's what that leads to. In terms of making those connections with employees and members of staff who have to sort of reach out, can you tell us what, what were those sort of moments for you sort of in life where you were like, oh, this, this has gone way beyond me just not being able to cope at work for a bit, or this is way beyond a difficult point in my life. This is now a serious issue which needs... My sergeant saw me crying in the car park. That was, that was the thing for me. My sergeant saw me, I'd finished work, and I'd come out... And I got in the car, and he was walking out, and he gave me the thumbs up, you know, like she seen someone. And as he walked past, he looked at me, and I was obviously giving it the old. And he saw me coming in the car park, and he did a U-turn, and he come back, and he said, what's the matter? And I said, no, I'm not, I'm sorry. No, what's the matter? I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry. And he said, come sit in the car with me. And the second I sat in the car with him, I snapped. And I just started crying. And that was the thing. And it, we just sat there, and he didn't know what to do. Got up with Chris, guys. Chris, you know, was a... Fantastic sergeant, but he's very old school, bottom of scotch in the bottom drawer sergeant, you know. And he didn't know what to do, but he had the humanity about it to just sit there and let me have a good sob. And it wasn't, you know, it, and it was difficult because he was saying, well, what was the job? What did this? What was the one? You know, we, we were looking for the one job, and I was as well. You know, what's the one job that made me just overbalanced? But with me, I always think it's like an owl uh, record needle with me. I think I just got blunted and blunted and blunted and blunted. And then eventually, I just went and started bouncing all over the show. I think I think it's the I'm going to guess the fourth episode. There's actually a couple of moments where he, where Chris, the lead character, not your sergeant, yeah, Chris, the character, Tim, um, 
He actually he's sitting in his car and he's and he's waiting. He's not only just waiting to start a shift, but he's waiting to see who comes, and he's also waiting to see what look yeah. they give him. Yeah, yeah. Almost yeah. as a way to sort of how how do I start the day today? Yeah. Do I start the day with the difficulty because my partner's going to be, or I'm going to start the day with me, this yeah. my ex sort of co-worker judging me about something? Where you become almost hypersensitive to this world around you that, that, that all their eyes are on you because there's yeah. a sense that. I can't cope and everyone's starting to see the cracks. I had a panic attack in the house day. Um, which is the name of my first LP, I think I'm going to call it panic attack in the house day. Um, I got into my dog food at about four o'clock in the morning. I was working what we used to call an EP, which was an evening patrol from like seven to three, I think it was. And I was driving home, I'd locked off, I'd locked off late, and uh, I was driving home. Oh God, I need dog food, you know. So it goes into the house day, and it was deserted except for guys and ladies emptying pallets of food, you know, you know, like they're all in the aisle, you're picking your way through these things, like looking for the balls, put them a bag of dogs, you know, because that won't be sleep, and uh, I'd go and get some dog food, and I was walking through the Asda, and I thought everyone was looking at me, it was the weirdest thing in the world, it felt like, I'm sitting there and I was kind of weird, because everyone was looking at me, but it was the weirdest thing in the world, I felt like, and what it was, was people were looking at me, and I started to think, I must look different, because I feel different. And I, I knew I was hitting that that upper level where I wasn't able to hide it. And I started, I was walking out with like a dog food, and I started, I felt it happening. I could feel it. it was like everything in me was similar. And I won't go use more, no more of the panic attacks than me. But I, I, was, I was on it, you know. And my biggest fear wasn't a panic attack. It wasn't doing myself bad. It wasn't, you know, running out in front of a car. It wasn't anything. It was just looking different in one second. Am I going to cry? Am I sweating? Am I turning bright red? And my hands shaking? That was my big fear. And it was the fatal thing about the more I thought about it, the worse it was getting. It was building, it was building, it was building. But that's Chris. It's like, I would have to, I got to a point where I was having to take a run up to do trivial things. Pay a check on a bank. I'll have to take a run up to that because I like, somebody might engage me a conversation. I might not be able to do it. Speak to me wife. Me then wife. I'll have to say to run up to that and like kind of hours work and I'd run through what I was going to say a couple of times so that I didn't croak on a certain word and then go. It's like walking over a, like a rickety bridge in ways of the last hour. You know, I'd, I'd like I'd have to pick the planks that I could stand up on and pray to God I didn't step on one that's not because if it did, I was done. I always think it's amazing. Uh, thanks for being so honest about that. Oh, I think it's no. absolutely fantastic that, that, that you're able to talk about it. And I think so many people will relate to it. And the thing that always strikes me when we talk about mental health figures, we're always talking about the people who've got through to the services or the people who died by suicide. They're the numbers that come up. But actually, the people who are living their life in that way, there will be other people who have variations of that, whose lives are blighted by whatever that particular issue might be, or the stress or the anxiety or... Uh, difficulties at home life and work life which are combined to create this un unbearable situation but there are people out there, they might be in this room they might be outside, they'll certainly be right across the, the Liverpool city region who aren't on those lists yeah. who are, but who are having that experience in the Asda, in the bank, talking to their family at home you know what, I guarantee you've looked in your mirror at the driver behind you and they're in crisis I absolutely guarantee it, and I, I can guarantee you've done it when it's been a copy, you know the thing when you pull up at a set of traffic lights and you think Oh God, I feel like I've done something, you know. There's a, there's a real chance that that person in the car behind you, that busy in the car behind you, is absolutely terrified at that moment. Is absolutely, I used to, there was times when I'd be out, I'm kind of a confident guy, like, you know, and I was definitely when I was doing the job. But there were times when I'd be terrified that a member of public was going to ask me a question. A complete honesty question. You know, she needs to any toilet around there. Oh no! Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? It's like I don't don't talk to me, you know. And it, it's like it's the weirdest thing. I used to do comedy with Jake, and I'd go and do a gig. I do stand up comedy. Well, Jake did comedy. I did something else. But I'd go to a gig, and um, I'd been like dealing all day with something like horrible, and I come in the green room and I'd be sitting there talk, and I'd be just absolutely sick of worry. Sick that I was going to start crying on stage. Sick that it's going to happen. And I used to think, like, it would either be the best thing for my career or the worst thing. You know, like, I'd go viral being this comedian who went mad on stage and started crying. That's what it, you know, 
and that's how I felt constantly. It's liberating, by the way, you said thanks for talking about it. I find it liberating talking about it now. When the show come out, because we never expected the show to be as big as it was, uh, we thought it was going to be this little thing on BBC Two, the BBC One got it, and then it went nuts and it's all around the world, and I'm sitting here talking to you, looking at the music. And it's like, did, I never expected that. And I watched the first episode of Home, then the second episode it was in London, and I was staying in a hotel in London, and my social media had just gone nuts. People tweeting, messaging, all this. And I went out for a walk down Nothing Hill, and I felt like I was going to go. I felt like I was going to... I felt like Chris did. It was the weirdest thing, because I felt like I'd opened my head, and the whole world was looking in my head, because I'd done a ton of interviews, a ton of media, all about Chris. I keep pointing to nothing, but all about Chris. And it was the, the, the weirdest thing. And the next morning, I went into the office with Toby, who's a, a script. Um, ever said it away for closely and 20 years ago I wouldn't have said a word and I walked into the office and I'm like you know what so I think my head back to do and we took a moment and after we went for a walk and I parked and just talked about it and it was so liberating to feel that whenever I needed to I could reach the side of the pool and just hold on for a minute and that's what I want people to feel like that they, they never quite stuck in the middle of the pool and you're out you're dead. You're only ever that far away from reaching and, and getting something to hold on to. That's what I think we should be able for. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's the phrase resilience then comes around, isn't it? That you get to the point where if you've sort of studied your own mental health or thought about your mental health or had sort of education around mental health, actually when those moments do come around, you're not, you're not protected from them. Those, those moments will come in the same way that you'll oh, have to actually. deal with grief and you'll have to deal with difficulty. But actually in that moment, you knew that the thing to do was to to let on, have that conversation, yeah. knowing that the way away from that moment was the morning off. Mm. You know, the, totally, yeah. and, and I guess, and that's the other thing, and the, those moments, were, I know you had a moment when you came back to the, the city and you went for a walk around yeah, the park yeah. where you had something similar yeah. kind of happen yeah. to you. I come back, I told Mick this the other day, we were on the phone on Wednesday. I got back from uh, London and it, it had been the weirdest week of my life. We get phone calls from all around the world to talk about the show and, and stuff. And it, it was just so intense and, I'd done a big interview with the Sunday Mirror uh, on, I think, Thursday night. I was sitting in my hotel room talking about... Because I tried to commit suicide. But like, I tried to commit suicide. And I'd gone into that for the first time ever. I gradually opened up, opened up, opened up, opened up, you know, and eventually ended up like Tonga Bay 2. Just everything was all over the place. And um, I got home and I said to my wife, I got, I was on the train coming back to Liverpool. And I rang out of my wife and said, Listen, my head's battered here. Can we go for a walk afterwards down the park? You know, she said, okay. So I got into Lime Street and she picked me up. And we had the dog and the baby in the car, the eight month old baby, which is why my eyes look like this. And uh, we got to Calderstone and I was talking to her about it. We have a great relationship. We talk about sort of stuff. And she was saying, just take it easy. Just don't, you know, you're home now and everything's going to be all right. You've got a weekend. You go back to London. You'll be all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, you're right. And we got out of the car, and we'd not even got out the car park at Coldstone. And this guy's walking towards us with his dog and his wife and his baby and a bus here. And I see him talking to the wife. Now, I've done loads of media that week. I've done like ACD news, I've done breakfast, telly, and all this kind of stuff. And um, he saw me, and he come walking towards me, and he went, Hey, mate, some show that, you know, nearly made up you're talking about those issues and everything else. And I'm like, Oh, Sam, yeah, great, yeah, you know. And he got off, and I said to him, I can't handle this. I can't handle it. I don't want to be. I've never wanted to be famous. I don't want to be famous. I feel real sudden, acute, like, pressure to, like, give a bit of myself to everyone, you know. And she's gone, behave yourself. Keep walking. She said, like, all you've got to do is just take it one step at a time. She gave me a bit of talk. She said, listen, Sam, this is never going to happen again. You'll be all right. I said, oh, carry on walking. And I swear we haven't gotten the length of this room. And I see this family walking towards us. And the fellow's talking to his missus. And he pumped. So, and I'm like, oh no, it's going to happen again. I said to her, it's going to happen again. And she's got hold of me and she's saying, you'll be all right, you'll be all right. I started going a little bit and the guy, sure enough, cuts, comes towards me and he walks up and I turn around and give me a big new seat smile, you know, all right, mate. And he went, all right, mate, what breed of dog is that? <laughs> <laughs> and it was exactly what I needed. He's a wine banana, by the way. <laughs> it, you mentioned, you know, thoughts of of suicide, yeah. you know, when we talk about you know difficult to re reach, you know, men in men in a room. 
having that, that conversation with men, with women, with, with everyone is one of those great taboos, isn't it? That, it, that this country has never been able to get its head around. Yeah. That in our life, virtually all of us will have at some point either suicide ideation, we'll think about suicide, that our, our brains will throw up suicide as an option yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation. And some indeed will, will, will attempt suicide and, and some will die by suicide. To me, it's, a, it's an absolute national tragedy that those 5,000 names that we, that we, we see on, a, on, a, on an annual basis are, are often accepted because, oh, it's good news, 350 fewer people die by suicide. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. That, it's great that less people die by suicide. 5,000 people or 4,635 people is too many people dying by suicide. And it's, again, an experience. I mentioned it before. It's an experience which is happening in people's lives right now. Mm-hmm. Like there are people now as we speak, thinking, and there were people probably during the time that we speak, oh, while someone will have died by suicide somewhere in the country. To me, it's, an, it's a national scandal that there isn't, you know, this like beacon that goes off every five minutes saying, if you feel like this, you don't have to feel like this. Mm-hmm. You know, this idea that I, I once heard the phrase, it was Clark Carlisle, who's a brilliant advocate for mental health, he used the phrase, he said, he said, don't think about it as I can't go on living think I can't go on living like this. Mm. Because the like this is the bit you can change. change. But so many people will have that thought where you go, I can't go on like this. You were kind enough to say that, you know, that, that was something that you'd, you'd experienced yourself. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God, yeah. It, I, I mean, to go back to being a copper, dealing with suicide is, like, I, probably the second worst thing that you're asked to deal with in the police. And it, it is... It's always profound. It's just, there's no other way to put it. It's profound that you're dealing with somebody, male or female, adult or child, who has, you know, done this thing. There's no, I don't know, I don't know terminology to you. It, it's just a thing. They've done it and it's happened. And I hope, you know, everyone's okay with me talking about it. I hate to be upset with anyone about it. It's, um, and it used to affect me terribly. There'd, there'd be little things that you'd notice after. You always like, uh, you'd see people who tidied up or people who leave notes for, for relatives. You know, like as in don't come in and stuff. And, um, you know, it, it still affects me now, to be honest with you. Like it's still like I look back, I can deal with it differently now. But, or, or better now. But it's still profoundly affected me now. But the moment for me was, I, I remember watching that brilliant Stephen Fry documentary on BBC a few years ago when it, when he walked out the play, you know, and he come back and he made this documentary. And he said he couldn't go over a bridge without thinking, would that kill me? And I suddenly realized, that's me. That is me. And this is, this is when I was like quite well into my I don't like to call it a crisis moment, you know, that period of my life. I was quite into that period. And I, I do remember thinking, wow, what profound I am. Oh, hang on, somebody else does that? Somebody else goes over the Uncle Bridge and thinks, oh, probably disappeared. You know, and I used to go, I went to one um, at uh, Shallon Way in St. Helens, which is a car park, it's a multi story car park in St. Helens. I remember sitting with the fella on the edge, we were waiting for the. Um, the negotiators to talk him down. And uh, I was sitting waiting with him. Like, it's, it's ridiculous, isn't it? You know, you're waiting for the negotiator. Like, I'm just, wait, wait, just hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's come up from Birkenhead, you know. It adds 20 minutes. Traffic allowed. And um, the parents were sitting there. And it was like, it got to a point of conversation where he was kind of saying, well, do you know what, mate? I mean, cheer up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the pair of us and I was saying I probably would see you enough wouldn't it you know and it, it's like it's mad to even think about it now but with me I got to that point I won't go to the details because it was weird but I, I got to a point where it was definitely definitely the easier option now for me I was lonely as well that was part of it you know your marriage breaks down you can't talk to people and you might have friends who are around you but that's different from being lonely that's just having people around you. If you can't talk to people, what's the point? You can talk on a level that, that's purely platitude or about the footy or something. That's great. If that's all you've got, it's better than not. But if you can't 
open up and talk. It's, God, you may as well be living in an igloo, you know. You can't, you just do, you can't communicate. And that moment, watching Stephen Fry was like, I'm not the only person to think like this. You know, and it, that was something amazing for me. I've got your question on because I would tell it. Where am I looking about that Stephen Fry document? No, I think I think it's. I remember once when I was. You I, forgot the question. Well. No, no, I, I had a, I had a really difficult time when I was just finishing university, and I always had, and and it, I was just, you know, when you just. People always go like people talk about their mental. I'm going to go over time here. When people talk about like their mental health, they often talk about um, feelings of sadness or feelings of loss or depression. Yeah. Um, and I, I was aware of that conversation. This is like 2000, 2001, something like that. So I was aware of those things. But I had the other, I had the other thing, which was I didn't feel anything. Mm. I didn't feel anything at all. Like there was no feeling. So when people mm. go, in, so I never, I never recognized feeling of suicide. Because I didn't, like, I couldn't, even if that was an idea, I would have thought of it being like, oh, I can't even be bothered even thinking about that. Like, because mm. nothing would tri trigger any sort of feeling or emotion in me. But to the point where I would get on the train and I would stand leaning against the, uh, the cabin, the front cabin, with my head leaning on the front cabin, thinking, if the train crashes now, I'll be the first that goes. Mm. And I won't have to think about it and it'll be a tragic accident and I'll just be one of the victims. And no one will know how I feel inside. But that absolutely, to me, summarized the difficult situation we have around mental health and having the conversation about mental health in workplaces, should bring it back to the reason we're here today, in workplaces in, in, with friend groups. Because the brain does a thing that it tricks you into thinking that this is the best course of action. This is the way that things have to be. This is your best option. And this is, these, these are the things we've got to learn about so that we know when that, that devil tries to do a deal with you, you can dismiss it and go, you know what, there's actually a slightly better door here that I'd rather step through. But we need to learn that that door is there and we need people to open that door for us. We need to learn, if, if absolutely necessary, how to kick that door down to get ourselves out of that situation. Because if we don't, we head back to the stats. And the stats just keep racking up. I did, the stats as well are fake as well, I think, because I've got terrible terms to use. But the stats are terrible because what they do is they they make you feel that you're not different. You know, when you've got when people say, and, and I say this as well, when you you know, there's five hundred thousand men have killed themselves, and they, you know, it, it's terrible. You suddenly go, oh well, I'm not alone. Then I, I can I can you know what I mean? I can do it too. It's all, loads of people are doing it. It's all right to do it. It's not like when I was a kid. It, it's kind of it, it, it's not in concert to everything I've said for the last hour. So forgive me, but when I was a kid, it just wasn't talked about. My cousin, second cousin, did it. Uh, Ronnie killed himself uh, in the seventies, and it was like Ronnie killed himself. Nobody talked about it, and he was like, it's just like. Gonna be, we should all be talking about it. What's wrong with that? You know. But then when I hear the stats being bounced around, I can only think for me. I sort of think, oh well, right. Well, it's all right to do if everyone else is doing it. That's me. I know I'm weird, but that's me. You know. That's I think, I think we, that's right. We we, we um, need to like t couch it in a way which is like. You well, know. Jake and I, Jake and I, uh, um, create an event um, for the episode 100 actually of, of, of Mental Health Monday. 226 uh, school children had died by suicide in the previous year. So we laid out 226. 20, 226 pairs of children's shoes on the steps of St. George's Hall. Because we were trying to create that thing of what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Not what's that number, what's that graph, what's that bar chart, what's that pie chart? What does that actually look like? And, and I spoke to one of the mums who was going to sort of contribute on the day. And I said, look, the idea is to put shoes out. Shoes represent people. I've got a pair of shoes like that. My son's got a pair of shoes like that. And she said, I'm so pleased she said that. She said, because I've his shoes, her son who died by suicide, are still by the front door. Oh. She said, and I'll leave them by the front door because I presume that one day he'll come in and or he'll, he'll be going out and he'll need his shoes. But they represent him in our house. But that put, that put a human mm. representation on what otherwise is a number and a tragedy of one day in the year. We all look at the numbers and go, well, this is sad. And then 364 days in the year, we get on with our lives and then wait for the next time to come around and go, I wonder why nothing happened to change this in the last year. Because we didn't proactively chase those numbers, go for those people, find them, 
Get them out of the crisis. Get the people who were heading towards the crisis, put them in a different direction. Get them into a life rooms. Get them finding services on the hub of hope. Get in texting shout to 85258 to speak to a volunteer. Yeah. Get in calling Samaritans on 116123. Getting them to call 999 in an absolute emergency. Or picking them up and taking them to a GP and having a conversation that gets them on some medication or gets them some social prescription. Because that's the thing we need to do. If, it, if there was an, uh, an emergency, a state of emergency, a pandemic of it, we take all those steps and we do it all today. If we wanted to it's, do it, totally agree. I totally agree. It, it, it should, you know, it should be open. It should be talked about. It should be something which is, you know, it, it shouldn't be ashamed. People should not be ashamed of saying, "I have thought about jumping off a roof." I have, you know, and I would never say that you shouldn't feel ashamed. I'm, uh, you know. Individuals can feel that they want to feel, and I think they, they have the right to feel that. But I think the more we talk about it, the less shame will surround that subject. And you know, if it makes it, if this week saves one life, that's a winner. I mean, literally, that's a winner. We, we, we did one. Ideally, you want to save 1,000, 100, 000, but it's still got one at least. Save those lives and improve, of course, the lives of so many. Uh, millions more. Uh, Tony, thank you so much for your time today. Respond is getting a second series, right? I hope so. Yeah, no, it is, mate. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm writing it now, even though we speak. I've literally got my laptop in charge in the green room. Yeah, excellent. Well, a huge congratulations on the success of the show. Thank you for being so honest with us uh, on the on the uh, on the panel today, and uh, thank you to everybody at the Mental Health and Work Summit and the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority for inviting Mental Health Monday uh, to be part of today. Thanks to everyone who supported the show over 250 episodes. We'll see you for the next 250. And uh, do check out more episodes of the podcast, which are all available uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this week's podcast. Thanks for checking out Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle. You can find me on Twitter at Mr. Mick Coyle. You can also find me, Mick Coyle, on Facebook as well. Don't forget, if you want to speak to somebody about your mental health, you can do so. The Samaritans, uh, free to call on 116123. You can find mental health services where you are. Just look for the Hub of Hope. Type in your postcode. It'll find those mental health services close to you. And for support in a crisis, you can text SHOUT to 85258. That's if you're experiencing a personal crisis, uh, you're unable to cope and need support. Uh, shout to 85258. That's a text line. Do get involved in those services. In an absolute emergency, always remember the number to call is 999. Thanks for downloading the podcast this week. We'll be back next week with more Mental Health Monday.